Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the fourth week of CRISPR-Con 2020. I'm Julie Shapiro with Keystone Policy Center. Keystone is a third party, nonprofit, non advocacy organization bringing together diverse perspectives on societal challenges. Keystone Policy Center is based in Keystone, Colorado, on the lands of the Ute people. We're proud to facilitate CRISPR-Con's conversations on science, society, and the future of gene editing. CRISPR-Con aims to highlight many perspectives and experiences, spark curiosity, build understanding, and share societal histories and contexts relevant to decisions on gene editing technologies and applications of agriculture and food, conservation, and health. 2020 is CRISPR-Con's fourth year. In the virtual format, we have 10 webinars and five themes over two months. Throughout the series, we have a broad ranging lineup of speakers, including life scientists and social scientists, journalists, business leaders, farmers, conservationists, consumer advocates, social justice advocates, global economic development leaders, religious leaders, funders and philanthropists, and more. If you've missed any of our earlier virtual sessions, we encourage you to check them out on our CRISPR-Con YouTube channel, which includes free access to our discussions dating all the way back to 2017. So far this year, we've discussed gene editing in the context of race and health disparities, indigenous perspectives, storytelling and journalism, gene editing research in China, and framing and governance of risks and benefits in gene editing in agriculture and food. Planning for this week's sessions was conducted in partnership with the Genetic Engineering and Society Center at North Carolina State University. Thanks to the whole GES team and special thanks to Katie Barnhill Dilling, Jennifer Kuzma and Patty Mulligan. The GES team's partnership on this effort was entirely in kind. They did not receive funding from CRISPR-Con or its sponsors for this event. We want to thank our sponsors for supporting the mission of CRISPR-Con and our ability to create these important conversations. Our programmatic sponsors for this year are Corteva and United Soybean Board. An additional sponsorship for this week comes from Genus. You can visit the virtual expo to link to relevant past CRISPR-Con content and also to learn more about this week's partners and sponsors. And now let me further introduce today's session theme. This week, CRISPR-Con will explore themes of equity, environment, and agriculture. On Tuesday, we explored how risks from safety to equity are defined and governed in food and agriculture systems. Today, we will explore gene editing, conservation, and climate justice. Societal impacts of climate change will not be distributed equally among geographies and populations. Proponents of gene editing forecast conservation applications whereby gene editing might aid in climate change adaptation and sometimes mitigation for vulnerable communities and ecosystems. Yet these technological solutions may create their own inequities and risks, both ecological and social. This session will explore what's at stake, including both risks and benefits in the use of gene editing to address issues at the intersection of climate, biodiversity conservation, and equity. We'll be focusing today's issues, uh, we'll be focusing today on issues for biodiversity conservation and for more discussion on risks, benefits, and governance of gene editing and agriculture, including discussion of potential applications for climate change, and for more on public health issues, such as gene editing for control of vector-borne diseases impacted by climate change, please be sure to check out our recent and upcoming sessions. We hope that the dialogue will bring out lots of lively discussion and debate among panelists and participants. If you're joining us via Hopin, please use the stage chat to submit questions for the panelists at any time during the panel conversation. Divergence and disagreement are welcome. Please be empathetic, curious, engaged, and respectful as you listen and share across various perspectives. At 4.30 Eastern, after our panel discussion, we'll transition into our Ideas Marketplace small group sessions. Please stand, plan to stick around for those and I'll share more info on how to do so in my closing remarks. At this time, I'd like to invite the panelists to join me on stage. I'll ask each of them to share their audio and video as I begin to introduce them, and you'll hear more about each of our panelists on their background at, through the course of the conversation. More detailed biographies are also available at our CRISPRCon.org website. Our moderator is Katie Barnhill Dilling, postdoctoral research scholar and affiliate at North Carolina State University Department of Forest and Environmental Resources and the Genetic Engineering and Society Center.
Welcome, Katie. Also joining us as a panelist is Shanta Reddy Alonso. She's Executive Director for Creation Justice Ministries. Sarah Fern Fitzsimmons is Director of Restoration for the American Chestnut Foundation at Penn State University. Elizabeth Hobeman is a research scientist for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia. And Riley Tidenfong is a PhD candidate at the Department of Communication at UC San Diego. I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'm thrilled to have everyone join us. I'll now be removing myself from the screen so that Riley can come on and, and I'll be turning things over to Katie to moderate our discussion of gene editing, conservation, climate, and equity. Thank you, Julie, and to everyone at Keystone for inviting into state Yes, Center to co-host this week's session. Thank you to our panelists for the time that you're providing and your expertise, and thank you to everyone out, uh, out there joining us today. Um, I join you from Durham, North Carolina, where I want to start by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Saponi Confederation, including the Okanichi, the Eno, and the Shikori, and the contemporary homelands of the Okanichi. As I try to do allied scholarship in, well, humanity. I believe that acknowledging this part of colonial history from which I've obviously benefited is one, ex one important starting point for how I engage with framing and claiming justice in our conversation today. Um, more generally, like Julie mentioned, I'm a postdoc at North Carolina State University working on issues of governance and engagement for environmental biotechnology. Um, we've given ourselves a tall order today, gene editing, conservation, and climate justice. And in order to scope these big ideas, like Julie noted, we've drawn some boundaries around these issues. The role of genetic engineering and gene editing in agriculture and public health, while certainly relevant to climate justice, are very well represented in some of the other panel panels that Julie mentioned. And today we're focusing the conversation on conservation at these intersections. Uh, to get this conversation started, I'll ask that each panelist please introduce themselves and their work on issues of climate justice, conservation and or gene editing. And in my round of things, Santa, you're up first. Hi, thank you. I'm so glad to be with all of you today. And um, my name is Shanta Reddy Alon, Executive Director of Creation Just Ministry. The ancestral lands of the Coachella Valley, California. Um, our organization, Creation Justice Ministries, is concerned with values of sustainability, stewardship, sufficiency, and justice when it comes to conservation, climate, energy, water. And we base our positions on issues um, based on what our members um, say. We are comprised of dozens of Christian denominations, communions, and fellowships that all have different decision-making processes for how they uh, come to um, certain positions on, on issues. And like most emerging technologies, um, the leadership of our member denominations have not yet come to very strongly formed positions on uh, gene editing, but our principles do apply. And so that is um, the place from which I will be making comments today. Thank you, Shanta. I'm getting feedback, my face was dark, sorry. I was trying to multitask. Um, Sarah, you're up next on my list. <laughs> Sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me be a part of this panel. I'm excited to uh, discuss these issues. My name is Sarah Fern Fitzsimmons. Uh, I work as the Director of Restoration for the American Chestnut Foundation, and I work out of Penn State University. Uh, my work is dedicated primarily to issues of trying to get a blight-resistant American chestnut tree back into the landscape uh, in its uh, native range, which is the eastern United States. And I'll be mainly talking about how uh, we work with uh, various climate issues to try and uh, both conserve this species and also get it back into the landscape. Thank you, Sarah. Elizabeth? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Hobman, and I'm um, a social scientist in Australia working in um, CSIRO. Um, not sure if anyone's aware of CSIRO, but we're Australia's national science agency, so it's a very multidisciplinary research organization. 
And my work here is um, sort of feeding into the synthetic biology future science platform. So I work with um, biophysical scientists there and basically by um, sort of co-designing research projects with them, I, I sort of identify what are the public attitudes and likely responses to various synthetic biology technologies that might be, you know, many years away, uh, just identifying what the public concerns are, what their risks and um you know, emotional responses to those technologies are and with the ultimate aim of, you know, can they sort of adjust how they're developing their technologies um, and also how they actually roll them out eventually. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. And Riley? Hello, uh, my name is Riley Tidingfong. I'm a PhD student at UC San Diego in the Department of Communication. So I'm joining you today from um, Kumeyaay Nation. And my research uses ethnographic methods to try and understand the challenges of incorporating community engaged practices into scientific research. And my current project looks at the role of engagement um, within gene drive research and development. I'm especially interested in conservation applications of gene editing and gene drive. And I'm interested in finding ways to ensure that indigenous peoples are included as the key stakeholders that they are in this context. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me and looking forward to our discussion. Thanks, Riley, and thanks again to all our panelists. Um, I think for the first question or the next teed up question, it's really important that we do at least a round robin for this one because everyone's perspectives are so different based on where they're currently situated. Um, and I think it helps us and our audience think about the breadth of issues we're going to cover today, even though we have tried to scope it somewhat. So starting us off, and if we could again um, go through a round robin, um, what do we mean when we talk about climate justice? And how does your organization or research consider dimensions of climate justice, equity, and conservation? So digging a bit deeper into some of the ways we introduced ourselves, thinking about the nuts and bolts of these things. Um, from a day-to-day -day basis. And if Shanta, you wouldn't mind going first again. Sure. So climate justice um, is the equitable sharing among uh, all humans, the gifts of God's creation, regardless of um, racial or national uh, background of status. And it's the holding to account of those whose domination or, greedy negative, uh, or greed negatively impact others' ability to rightly share in God's creation. Um, so in the context of uh, this conversation, uh, we're very concerned about um, justice for those who are most vulnerable to uh, the climate emergency um, in terms of their resilience needs, uh, as well as, um, you know, that not includes wildfires. Diversity collapse, it includes collapses, uh, many issues that we're going to explore a little bit deeper later. Um, so I would say justice focuses primarily on the human world, but our care for creation and our attendance to um, justice, among, justice among humans also relates to, to all species uh, because we depend on each other uh, in the circle of life. And I often look to the wisdom tradition when I think about our interrelatedness with all species. And uh, we read in Ecclesiastes 3.19 that the fate of the animals and the fate of the humans are intertwined for both share the same breath. And so as we look at um, our moral responsibility for justice with each other, we know that that has to encompass all of God's creation as well. Thank you, Shanta. Sarah? Yeah, so um, the American chestnut uh, was uh, eliminated, virtually eliminated from the landscape because of the importation of a non-native disease. And today with globalization occurring at the rate that it does, you see a lot of this importation, not just in the United States, but in other locations of non-native pests, non-native diseases that are putting a uh, great threat to other um, uh, species, tree species in particular, um, that are being virtually er eradicated from the landscape. And so uh, because of the rate at which this is occurring, uh, something like the American chestnut, which has been uh, gone from the veritable consciousness for over a hundred years, um, we have a very different landscape uh, in which to return this species than what it had encountered uh, over 100 years ago when it was extirpated. Um, so uh, our work is trying to, to look at not only creating a, a tree that can um, be resilient in the landscape in this new world that, that we're putting it back into with 
the added benefit of disease resistance, uh, but also ensuring that it can deal with, again, a very different environment that it's it's now dealing with. Um, with climate change, uh, it's having to deal with different diseases that are moving northward, like Phytophthorus and Amomi. Um, it's having to deal with different climatic zones uh, as those shift northward. And the biggest um, diversity of the species in the southern, is in the Southern Appalachians, where uh, that edge of the range is now being lost. Um, uh, so those are the kinds of considerations that we're dealing with in terms of uh, species reintroduction. And a lot of the things that we deal with, um, although I deal with a very specific um, organism, uh, a very uh, an individual species, a lot of the work that we've done uh, can be paralleled and analogous to other species that are in, under threat, um, like uh, the ash or the hemlock or the, the beech. Um, all of these species are, are facing similar issues. Um, we're also dealing with uh, issues of how to restore this back into the landscape. How will it impact um, not only the people of a certain area, but also um, the, the wild sprouts, the wild American uh, chestnuts that still persist, although in a stunted way. How will that impact that? Um, and in dealing with um, transgenic technologies and biotechnologies that we've used to introduce disease resistance, um, how will that uh, impact uh, reintroduction um, versus other technologies like biocontrol or traditional breeding techniques. Um, these have all come to uh, a nexus uh, right about now. Um, and, and I don't know if I may, but if I may put in a plug for um, the public yeah. comment period um, for uh, transgenic American chestnut is open until Monday. And so if you're interested in transgenic American chestnuts, um, uh, that we'll talk more about that. But um, it, the reason that this is all coming ahead now is primarily because that's open for another four days. So, thank you, Sarah, Elizabeth. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess in my work, how I'd be looking at um, climate justice and equity and conservation, sort of um, from different angles. Um, but I guess. As a, as a social scientist, I'm, I'm wanting to hear what the public think and also what those vulnerable communities think. So we try to focus on um, um, those groups of people who are vulnerable and who are likely to be impacted by future oriented technologies. Um, so we get to hear their voices now in the piece as, as the scientists are developing the technologies uh, and also along the way through as the technologies are developed. I think um, also at SIRA, we have a very strong initiative in responsible innovation, and that's really placing at the forefront of scientists' mind, uh, minds the importance of actually considering, well, what are the intended impacts of our technologies, genetic solutions, um, and what are the unintended impacts? And maybe the best way to actually unpack those is to, to get people, vulnerable communities, those who actually have a stake, to have a say in the conversation. Um, so it's sort of like a co-designed research approach. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Elizabeth. Riley? Yeah, so climate issues are absolutely produced through structures that have prioritized profit over our planet, that have suppressed the knowledge of communities who uh, sustainably stewarded their lands for millennia. So absolutely, climate justice has to work to dismantle those systems that uh, continue to uphold extractive practices that have dispossessed indigenous peoples of their lands and rights to determine, you know, what happens on their lands. Um, and that keep exposing black and other communities of color to the pollution and degradation produced by those extractive industries. So yeah, absolutely. These communities have to be at the center of our approaches to climate justice. And now when I think of how conservation fits into the picture, I'm actually looking critically at the types of ideas and values and practices that encompass what we call conservation, um, it's a term worth interrogating. You know, wh what are we trying to conserve and how? Uh, who gets to carry out actions or projects that we call conservation? Uh, at one time in this nation, we removed indigenous peoples from their lands to make national parks and we called that conservation. So I'm paying attention to the legacies of this history and asking, you know, what forms of exclusion may be carried out in the name of conservation now, um, including maybe in relationship to some of these technologies that we'll talk about today. Thank you, Riley. And one of the one of the things I find most compelling about this combination of 
of scholars and practitioners, it, a, so there's so many layers they consider when they think about justice, who's justice, thinking about human and non-human nature alike. And it's just a really compelling group of people to think about these hard questions. So thank all of you for your perspectives. Um, I do want to draw the audience's attention to the chat feature um, and reiterate that you're welcome to add questions at any time and they will be moderated on our end and hopefully we'll get some version of that when we draw and or dig into those questions in a bit in a bit. Um, so please feel free to add questions when you think of them and we'll we'll get to them when the time comes. Um, and I'm not going to expect the next few rounds to be round robin like I did previously, but I expect you all know how to jump in and step back as appropriate. Um, and I'll move on to some of our um, later questions. So I think a lot of what you all started to talk about um, is sort of the framing of the questions, the framing of the problems we're identifying. Um, and, and importantly, for a number of you started talking about the historical context, both for the ecology and the human history. But as we think about all of those things coming together and giving us the context we live in currently, what actions and outcomes should we be prioritizing with respect to climate justice and conservation? And how do we prioritize? On what basis? On what knowledge? Well, I, I can jump in and just say from a, from a forest health perspective, um, you know, the primary interest of, of mine personally and also professionally is to try and rescue uh, native forest tree species that um, are greatly impacted uh, not only by climate change, but again, also these, these invasive pests that wouldn't be here without you know, some sort of globalization. Um, you, we start to wrestle with things like assisted migration. Should we start to be rescuing species from uh, the farther, farther southern parts of the range and moving them north when that in itself creates different impacts for northern communities of plants and animals that they don't ordinarily uh, encounter in either direction? Um, is that something we should be engaging in um, ahead of, you know, or in, um, in consultation with climate change models and, and at what rate should we be doing that? So these are the kind of questions that we wrestle with in terms of not only chestnut um, specifically, we, we do that with chestnut, but with other species as well. Um, you look at a species like Florida terea, um, which has a very limited range, but is greatly under threat um, due to various aspects. Um, and, and there are two different camps, well, probably more than that, but um, you know, saying we need to rescue the species for the greater good of forest health and to ensure that this species persists in the landscape. And, but then there are others who say, well, you know, you're, you're then harming other ecosystems where this species um, shouldn't be a part of it. Um, so there's a lot of um, this wrestling, and there's no real right answer, right? But it, there's a lot of wrestling with these questions of, is it our forest, <laughs> whose forest health is it? And, and, you know, should these species be rescued or not? And so from our perspective, that, those are a lot of the questions that we ask ourselves. And I think too, you raised it at the end, what is forest health, right? Like we've got shifting ideas about what that means over time. So that's a really important um, point to mention. Sorry, did I speak over someone? Santa. I can jump in. Uh, I have a lot of questions about process and how our values are being embodied in, in processes to decide how are these uh, gene editing issues and priorities um, being identified? Um, who is being asked to be involved in problem definition? Uh, who gets drawn into consultation? How are we defining consent and who needs to have consent for uh, moving forward with the project? Um, how are we sinking shared investments and how are we defining how communities share benefits of these initiatives? Um, and then what stop gaps and accountability measures uh, exist if and when there are unintended consequences uh, that unfold? Uh, who will be responsible and how? Uh, these are all important ethical questions that, um, that I have uh, as someone who is exploring these issues. I might push on that a little bit just because I'm always looking for process solutions as well. 
Do you have an example from your own organization that you're particularly proud of, of a process that you think illustrates the kinds of issues that you just highlighted? So our organization uh, cares a lot about um, the Environmental Protection Agency, environmental justice, um, uh, meaningful engagement definition, and how meaningful engagement is done as a project is being scoped, um, whether it's for the, uh, you know, a NEPA review uh, or anything like that. So there have been, um, you know, public comment periods. There have been opportunities for consultation in communities. Um, I would say that the ones that are stronger um, really involve uh, different stakeholders in the communities early and often uh, about when, how, and where uh, consultation happens. Um, and it really involve people in um, setting up advisory committees um, so that can have oversight over that process um, in a later at a later period. Riley, I know you talked a bit about the limitations of some of these ideas, and I kind of want to put in conversation some of your points about their value, but also the limitations around some of these engagement processes and the challenges to getting, I don't think we could get it right, but at least getting it better. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I think um, what's exciting about the types of conversations we're having right now in this context is that the points that Shanta brings up about meaningful engagement, about participatory engagement, like are really moving from the margins to the mainstream. And it's getting us to grapple with questions that frankly we should always be asking about research and technology development, right? Um, thinking about the distribution of risks and benefits, thinking about the fact that the concept of a risk or benefit is like a highly contingent idea, right? So. I'm really glad we're having these conversations. I think sort of regardless of, you know, what ends up happening with these technologies, if we can commit to adopting more of these participatory practices within science and technology development, like I think we're gonna be better off no matter what. Um, so, but yeah, some of the limitations of engagement, like, you know, it's, it's something that we talk about a lot and feel good about inclusion and, and all that, but we have to really operationalize what we mean by engagement um, or otherwise risk like reifying some of the same inequities under the name of engagement. And I think one thing I'll emphasize for us on this topic is just trying to really look to communities as um, as knowledge holders and as having, you know, situated expertise that's absolutely crucial to engage in um, the questions we're asking about this research and the decisions we're making about, you know, whether or not to implement it. So um, it matters, you know, the activities we do that we call engagement, you know, it's not, in my opinion, engagement to go do an educational campaign to teach people what gene drive is. Like, that's an important activity, yes. But um, to me, engagement is getting more at these reciprocal uh, opportunities for um, communication. It's about iteratively designing the research so that it reflects the values and addresses the questions communities have, right? Um, it's not kind of this deficit model where we say, you know, if people just know more about the technology, they'll probably come around to it, right? That kind of treats engagement as more of a way to uh, obtain authorization rather than like an opportunity to build uh, important relation and dialogue that, like I said, we should have probably been having all along. Um, we're getting some questions coming in from the world out there. And the, the, one of the questions is um, that I think, especially around some of, the, some of the things you just mentioned, Riley, is what a gene drive is and how it relates to the climate conversation. Um, and I think that would be really interesting coming, sorry to keep you on the spotlight, but I think that'd be really interesting coming from your perspective because you think about it from, from a very specific critical perspective. So it's not just descriptive. Would you mind? sharing your take on that? Sure, yeah. So a gene drive is a gene editing technique that basically biases typical rates of inheritance, right? So think of Mendel and his peas and the fact that um, in typical circumstances, an offspring of sexually reproducing organisms is going to have a 50% chance of inheriting some trait from its parents, right? So a gene drive 
sort of hacks that rate and makes it can make it really close to 100% um, using gene editing tools like CRISPR-Cas9. So there, I can speak to a few applications, um, or I'll speak to one in particular, and, and maybe Elizabeth can weigh in on, on this too and thinking of coral. But um, one application within conservation I look at is gene drive to uh, as a tool for in, invasive species management. So you know, there's a lot of discussion around gene drive within public health for uh, you know suppressing populations of or eradicating uh, populations of mosquitoes that vector disease to humans. And we're thinking of similar things within um, endemic species of birds in Hawaii, for, in for instance, that are vulnerable to avian malaria. And so malaria vectored um, to birds by mosquitoes. So, and, and this connects into the issue of the climate crisis because as you know, our planet is warming, we're seeing mosquitoes um, um, range extend into higher elevations where some of those endemic birds have in the past sought refuge from them. So we're expecting to see the transmission of uh, vector-borne disease to those endemic birds uh, reach into higher elevation and probably intensify at those at those lower ones. So, um, so yeah, there's that's one example. I feel like I've been talking for a long time, so um, I can turn it to maybe Elizabeth can speak to others. Yeah, I guess there are other examples um, of gene drive work and genetic engineering. So um, ones that are familiar to me in my work include, um, say, the invasive pest management for, say, feral cats or rodents on islands. So um, don't know the specifics, technicalities of the actual gene editing approach, but basically or fundamentally, uh, what it aims to do is to bias the sex determination of offspring. So, so you would have, say, feral cats only um, bearing males, or it could be females only, and then eventually over successive generations, you know, eventually the species would become extinct, and the same with rodents as well on islands. Um, other examples, my colleague um, is looking at the crown of thorns starfish and in a similar way you'd bias um, the, the sex determination sort of genes so that it wouldn't spread and proliferate across the Great Barrier Reef as much as, much as it is now. Yeah, so there are a few examples there. Mm. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, it looks like we have an audience question about what we mean by climate justice. And I think some folks have missed the introduction. So rather than that exact question, I wonder if you, the panelists, could think of what it would look like, like for climate, like what climate justice means it looks like. So almost like a scenario or a set of scenarios, according to the work that you've done. Obviously, you don't have to go global. That's an impossible solution. But in the context of your work, what would climate justice look like or mean to you? I can't say that I'm an expert in climate justice, but just from my limited reading, I would say that climate justice is about studying or recognising that the impacts of climate change are disproportionate across the population and certain groups actually feel it more than others. And to then restore a sense of justice, you need to actually um, assist those particular groups and those ecosystems as well. It's not just the people. Um, and then work with them to develop solutions to, to achieve, um, you know, to, to recover from that, those climate change impacts and to adapt into the future. Also looking at mitigation activities, not just adapt adaptation as well. So it's like a suite of solutions. Um, but that's that's just my outside perspective. You know, the the rest of the panel may have more of a expertise in climate justice. So right now, those who are around the world are least responsible for our climate crisis are often um, disproportionately bearing an unequal and severe burden of that crisis, be it through health effects such as um, asthma, cancer, reproductive harm. Um, vulnerability to wildfires, vulnerability to droughts, floods, to um, storm surge, sea level rise, 
um, all of those vulnerabilities fall disproportionately on those who are least uh, equipped at this time to uh, adapt. Uh, and the, the recovery um, opportunities often disproportionately end up going to those who are privileged and wealthy. And so uh, climate justice is about equaling the playing field uh, and engaging in um, an emerging uh, conversation that Creation Justice Ministries is getting involved in on eco reparations. Um, you know, what to um, do thoughtful land return uh, what does it do mean to prioritize um, making sure that Black farmers have the opportunities that they need to prioritize um, feeding their communities? Uh, what does it mean to um, just do conservation in a way that prioritizes um, the original caretakers of land and species? Um, and so as we look at um, climate justice, it is the dismantling of many historic injustices. And um, as a Christian organization, we are especially attentive to this in the conservation world because of the um, very destructive history um, of uh, the doctrine of Christian discovery uh, in this country and its influence on um, settler colonialism as well as the um, enslavement of people of African descent. Uh, to help the folks at home um, who aren't as familiar, would you mind giving like a two minute summary of what the doctrine of discovery is as best you can? I know it's a complex very powerful. It's a, com it's a complex. Um, yes. Yeah, so the doctrine of uh, discovery, uh, or as uh, we call it now, the doctrine of Christian discovery, uh, is uh, it comes out of a series of papal bulls. Um, so messages issued out of the Vatican in the 1400s uh, that were used by Christopher Columbus and those who engaged in settler colonialism, as well as the African slave, tr slave trade um, as a justification for the expansion of empire for uh, white men of European descent uh, to engage in uh, Christian empire building um, by claiming, discovering uh, and claiming uh, lands and, um, and settling on them. And um, this also led to a devaluing of native species um, and the bringing in of other species that were seen as more uh, civilized or, or superior. So much of the trouble that we're in uh, comes from the, the mindsets that were put forth in these um, documents that were meant to somehow offer a um, sick divine uh, justification for uh, activities that were just pure empire expansion and greed. Uh, and we're continuing to live with the consequences of uh, this doctrine today. It's made its way not only into uh, theology of um, many mainstream uh, belief systems, but also into uh, US law. Uh, and so as a Christian organization, we work hard to um, identify and um, dismantle uh, the legacy of the doctrine of discovery. Thank you, Shanta. It's, it's always a bit jarring to remind ourselves what some of our foundations of wealth, like our national parks and some of our wilderness preservation ideas are rooted in um, the history where we live. Um, sorry, I didn't want to step on anyone else's response or if you're ready for another question. So bringing it back to the title, um, Let's, let's bring it back to some of these genetic technologies. So what is the role of emerging genetic technologies when it comes to climate justice and conservation? And how do they fit within these broader concerns and challenges? Well, again, I have a fair, fairly narrow, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, look and perspective into this particular issue, and and it and again, it, it deals mainly with with native species and and that of forest health. But um, you know, currently the technologies that we've used with with chestnut and that are utilized in other species, particularly in the eastern United States, um, you know, we use traditional breeding. That's been um, part of uh, agriculture and also forest health for decades, if if not centuries. Um, then you look at uh, uh, sort of biocontrol options. Uh, those are available to us and have been for quite some time. Um, then you start to look at the, the biotechnological um, uh, methodologies like um, 
like uh, genetic modification, uh, so transgenics, um, these technologies have been around for a few decades, um, so they aren't quite as modern as they used to be, um, but come with uh, different ramifications than uh, other more historical um, type of technologies that you can apply to these problems of developing resistance to pests and diseases. Um, as we look to the horizon of things like uh, CRISPR or gene editing technologies, um, the hope is that that makes these tasks of trying to give um, species the tools they need to persist in the landscape, hoping to make that task, task a lot easier. Um, in, in the case of the American chestnut, um, we would love to be able to apply something like gene editing um, and, and give the tree its tools it needs to, to resist the disease that it has um, no, um, uh, none of its own uh, tools to, to fight off. Um, so you not only have something like chestnut blight, which is a fungal disease, there's also Phytophthora cinnamomi, which you can't fight off. Um, and, and insect diseases like Asian ambrosia beetle, these things all um, are imported and, and exotic um, species that, that American chestnut probably wouldn't have encountered um, had it not been for globalization. Um, so then you start to say, well, um, can we use all of these technologies together in order to try and uh, again, give these species the tools it needs to fight off um, these, these attackers that it wouldn't have uh, otherwise encountered. And I think that's gonna be really important again, as globalization increases, as, you, um, as these species are gonna to continue to encounter other um, uh, pests and diseases, as, as uh, things like Phytophthora are gonna move northward as, um, as it can handle uh, warmer climates um, better than it can colder climates. Um, and then again, the species themselves, uh, they can adapt in much slower time scales uh, especially tree species, which is my focus. Tree species take a, a lot longer to adapt um, or much longer time scales than we have uh, where in which climate change is occurring. And so you go back to these questions of, um, you know, can we use these technologies or even um, uh, less modern technologies to try and assist them in, um, in gaining this, those adaptations or helping move them around um, so that they can uh, better uh, survive uh, these changes that are coming at them much more quickly than they would otherwise have encountered. Thank you, Sarah. And just wanting to point out that you, you as you talk about, you know, your perspective from the chestnut, you know, as you, you described, I believe, is limited or narrow. I think it's really important to also reiterate that this is a precedent setter. So even though it may be one species, there are so many eyes on watching what happens. And so the the one, the, that it's one species, I think might be not misleading. I think there's more to it than that though. Like there's people watching and people are wondering how other tools might follow suit and other, for other species. Um, yeah, they, I think, thanks for bringing that up. And I think that's why I try to touch on these other um, species that are under threat, you know, and, uh, you know, like ash, like hemlock, like beech, and, and not just in the eastern U.S., that ten, that happens to be my my focus and, and my expertise, but, you know, you look at Hawaii and, and Ojai um, sudden death, and I mean, these are issues that are um, greatly impacting the greater ecology of the islands, and, and you're going to see that pop up more and more often, um, again, as these trees come under threat. So, so I agree. Thank, thanks for um, making that more explicit. Yeah, and I think one of the other things to remember um, about these conservation tools, and they are tools, however controversial some of them are, um, in places like islands, there are so few either actual islands or just sort of mountain biogeography islands. There's, there's so few ways that some of these species can adapt. And so that's been part of the concern is that humans helping, at helping species adapt, especially to climate change, but not just. Um, so we have a question from the audience that I'm gonna draw out because it's relevant to the broader question that I've asked about gene editing and its role um, regarding potential applications and benefits. This, this question or this audience member asked if there are other GE organisms as close to release for conservation purposes in other places in the world. I, I believe they're referencing as close to the chestnut. Um, it sound, they say it sounds like the black-footed black ferret is receiving serious consideration what does the panel think of genetic technologies for, oh, that's two separate things. Um, okay, so thinking about other species, we did talk a little bit about some of the coral in Africa and the invasive species management in islands. 
Um, I know more about rodents. Sounds like Elizabeth knows more about cats. Um, so thinking through the level of laboratory success, the chestnut is certainly the furthest along, just to clarify that, that um, question. But going back to some of the benefits, some of the concerns, I do want to draw our attention to the Australian context because Elizabeth works on public perception and public attitudes around these things. And so rather than the nuts and bolts of the technology itself, the sort of the idea of these technologies. Um, so could you share some insight on, on your work? You're still muted. You have left yourself on mute. It's, it's harder to tell on this platform than I did for Zoom. <laughs> I thought it was unmuted. Um, so yeah, in, in our work, we, um, we conducted a national survey of the Australian public, a representative sample of 8,000 Australians. And uh, we had a number of technologies that we embedded within the survey and we had a little storyboard. So it was very um, visual. It was a problem sort of solution focused narrative that we presented. And a couple of those technologies were, were related to, say, um, invasive pest management and also endangered species and using genetic tools to, to either um, put into species greater diversity for endangered species or to actually do that sex biasing sort of approach in the case of invasive pest species. Uh, and we found that um, overall, and, and remember this, you have to always caveat um, these responses depending on you know the communication that you're giving to people it's very very contextual um, in general the public were more supportive or they weren't averse to the technologies and the applications however when we looked at uh, the qualitative responses there definitely were concerns raised there about obviously unintended consequences and the desire to actually do a lot of testing before actually releasing um, this technology in, in the wild, so to speak. Um, so people are sort of acutely aware of, of, of that. And I guess based on previous experiences where, you know, biocontrol initiatives have, have gone wrong, um, those sort of stories are very salient and negative and frame people's willingness to sort of accept something that sounds really quite scary. Um, so, so following up on that survey, we were going to do some work in, in local communities in Western Australia, doing face-to-face -face focus groups to sort of unpack some of those, you know, concerns and, and, and see how people would respond when we presented the, the application in a more localised manner. So this actually could happen in your area, given the feral cat problem that surrounds your community. However, because of COVID, we couldn't actually go out and do our focus groups. So in that case, we reverted again to, to a survey approach. Um, and again, we sort of included an animation of the problem and the solution, but we're hoping to actually follow up with some of those survey participants over the telephone or to, to schedule online discussion boards um, to sort of get, get richer data about what it means to them if we are actually introducing this you know, synthetic biology technology into, into feral cats in their communities. So that'll be interesting to see. Thank you, Elizabeth. And so, uh, another audience question is interested in thinking about assessing public attitudes and opinions about a technology when there's relatively low public awareness. Um, and I know that the Australian New Zealand context is really quite different than the US because there's been a lot more campaigns around um, predator free and some of these other initiatives that are more national. But in spite of that, could you speak to that that challenge of thinking about engagement, trying to think about how it's situated in lower awareness publics and how those fit together? Yeah, sure. So also in a survey, we did find that awareness and, you know, even base knowledge of synthetic biology of what that term actually means was relatively low across the population. Um, and I guess that's part of our um, sort of goal is to actually raise awareness through through doing these surveys and engaging with the, with the communities. And over time, we're hoping to repeat the survey and maybe we will see greater levels of awareness. Um, but yeah, it's something that we do grapple with. How can we ask people for whether they're willing to accept something
just don't really know anything about. And that's why we need to have more of a dialogue, I, I believe, not just um, surveying a one-way approach because through dialogue you get to answer people's questions in real time. And if we can also include the synthetic biology technologists there, the actual scientists to answer those questions in person, um, I think that that um, builds a sense of trust as, as, the, as the technology is developed as well. Sorry, my puppy is, is crying <laughs> in the background. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. I, yeah, I've barricaded a door here, so who knows how long that will last. Very French Revolution. <laughs> um, I, I want to think too about, um, so that's, that's, the, that's the, you know, the Australian New Zealand perspective or, or Cyrus perspective and figuring out how to engage in these complex, scientifically technical, but also socially complex spaces is really challenging, especially when a perennial goal is thinking about who has not yet been included in these conversations and how do we reach, have a broader reach and a more inclusive reach, especially one, traditionally marginalized groups and two, um, groups that are in, inherently more impacted by some of these decisions. Um, and I guess, I think this is a good segue to some of Riley's work to think about how her experience is talking about these te genetic technologies and some of the things where you've worked and what your experiences have been there. Sure. Yeah. So I, a couple of things come to mind. Um, first, I think a really good recommendation for the type of engagement we're doing with particular communities, like coming from a particular cultural context, um, for instance, like indigenous communities who want to engage in this work, I think it's important to like ground the questions we're asking in values um, and concepts coming from those communities. And there's really excellent um, example of this type of approach coming out of the Maori, Aotearoa, New Zealand context. So um, Maui Hudson, Simon Palmer, they've done really interesting studies um, taking up this co-design approach, working with uh, Maori stakeholders and saying, you know, what are the relevant concepts or values um, within your culture that we need to be thinking about when we're weighing these questions about risk and benefit within gene editing um, or gene drive in particular? And I would say of the preliminary research I've been able to do in talking to um, folks in Hawaii, both scientists and, and community alike, I think for me, the key takeaway is that, and this is similar to what um, Maui Hudson and his colleagues have found, but is that, you know, indigenous folks, um, one are obviously a lot of different people and they're very heterogeneous. So it's hard to even talk about this group uh, generically, but, but, in, but in general, like these are not a community of people who are averse to technology, like a priori, right? Like these are communities of people who are really amazing makers and users of technology and my work centers in Oceania and you know we come from communities that are like the greatest wayfinding uh sea navigating communities like I like to try and dispel this myth that sometimes it's misinformation that um prevents more acceptance or willingness to adopt these types of technologies and so that we can, again, still do that important work of raising awareness, but also move past that and get to these deeper questions of like, what are the values that might be in tension or in conflict? And, um, you know, things I hear from folks in community who I've interviewed is like, who's funding the work that matters, right? Um, who are the scientists working on it? Are there, are they, you know, do they have good relations in community? So I think there are absolutely ways we can set up research to engage the values and concepts from these communities, but we have to do that in relationship with them to find out what those things are that matter. Thank you, Riley. Um, Shanta, I would actually like to point this question to you as you talk about the, the work that you've done, um, not to put you on the spot, but you came to this conversation thinking like, well, I don't know as much about gene editing, what am I gonna say? And I think that actually can be one of the most valuable ways to come into a conversation because we all carry certain assumptions about these technologies just by virtue of what we work on. Um, so I'd be really curious to know from the perspective of the work that you've done, do these genetic technologies feel as urgent, as problematic? Um, 
what is your take on the role of some of these technologies and trying to find solutions to some of the problems you mentioned? Yeah, thanks for asking. So one of the comments that was made in a previous panel that I tuned into, um, and I'm unfortunately not remembering the name of the person who made this comment, um, but she was representing an organization called Native Biodata, was um, that it, we should not mistake people's uh, suspicion about this technology for um, an aversion to technology. Uh, it's, it's more an aversion to exploitation and a deep understanding of a history of exploitation. Um, and so uh, that is part of that. I really resonated with that because I connect with communities that um, as they assess emerging technologies, uh, definitely have that as an important measuring stick that they're, they're watching for when they're looking at any uh, emerging technology. Um, our community has done a little bit of um, thinking together about uh, geoengineering uh, more so than the gene editing issues. And I think there are some um, parallels when we think about um, ethics uh, and how we would approach uh, these questions. And um, the biggest conclusion uh, that I remember hearing from people was, um, well, what are the things that we need to do right now and with urgency to make sure that we don't have to make drastic decisions like that in the future? So I do think that bringing these conversations to bear now uh, really makes people sit up and listen. Uh, when they think about the drastic measures that we may have to take to intervene in um, nature as God gave it to us, um, to, to continue to um, adapt to climate, the climate crisis and, and to make this a, a livable and sustainable world for all of us. Um, I also am interested in, um, as we think about these issues, a lot of things about process as I raised those questions earlier um, and I'm concerned in particular, yes, about who's funding uh, these, um, these things um, and how, how conservation priorities are being made. Um, we know that we're losing biodiversity at a really scary, rapid rate, uh, and we, um, we will possibly have more areas where we need to intervene in a timely way than um, there will be capacity for. So, so who gets to decide? Uh, where we go and what we do. Um, and there's a, there's a quote that um, I go to often when I think about our conservation priorities um, from Senegalese activist Baba Diyum. Uh, we will not save what we do not love. We will not love what we do not know. And we cannot know what we have not learned. Uh, and so, you know, who's, who's learning and who's getting the big picture of, um, of the places that may need intervention? The, in the future. And another question that said, thank you, Shanta, that comes out of some of these conversations we've just had, um, especially thinking about the potential for rel relatively drastic interventions on some level to, to protect or to mitigate our own, or at least some of our own uh, behaviors. Um, so there's a question that I think from someone who seems to know Riley's work pretty well, and they asked for you to please speak to the concerns around trying out biotechnology tools in other people's backyards. And could you speak to the comparison with nuclear testing? So I think that's an interesting zone of sacrifice uh, parallel I think I've seen you talk about. Would, would you be able to speak to that? Please? Sure. Thanks for that question. Um, yeah, so one area that I think is worth really looking at critically in this context is um, what some call site selection or how we decide where we are in particular trialing some of these emerging technologies, right? So um, I'm not talking about a context in which there's sort of a grassroots effort to say, let's, let's maybe consider this gene editing te technology for issues of island biodiversity, but rather this sort of disturbingly uh, common phenomenon within this field to say islands could be a great place to test something like gene drive where there are, um, you know, potentially high risks of, you know, continuous propagation of a gene drive for those that are designed to self-propagate um, that shape, you know, concerns about the containment of gene drive while we're trying to incrementally bring it to the field, right? So, you know, you look at the guidance documents from the World Health Organization um, from 
the National Academies of Science, and they make explicitly recommendations to uh, consider islands as an isolated geography wherein we could test these types of things. And, you know, to Shanta's point about communities kind of using as a measuring stick histories of exploitation, um, you know, if you're from an island community that's been treated as amenable and disposable to experimentation, then you're probably looking at that with a pretty critical eye and rightfully so. So um, I've written about this. I have an article published in Human Biology, if folks are interested in reading it, um, that gets a little bit more deeply into this. But yeah, I've written about this in um, you know, relationship to histories of nuclear testing uh, throughout Oceania and how you see really the same kind of rhetoric being used about island isolation and, and how that really just is incommensurate um, with indigenous Pacific Islander perspectives on, you know, geographic space, right? Like, we don't think of the ocean as isolating us, but connecting us, right? Like I said, you know, we, our, our people have navigated the ocean with expertise and, and continue to uh, sustain that knowledge. So it, it's a different sort of ideological orientation to these things and relationship to space. And I think it's one worth um, really paying attention to because in the example of, of nuclear experimentation, like we see that the effects of um, that experimentation has been absolutely concentrated to those islands that were treated as uh, zones of sacrifice, but also have made their way around the world, right? We, we have traces of, of radiation in all of us, right? So. Um, so yeah, I'd say these are these are the things I'm thinking about on on this topic, and just you know what kinds of geographies we're looking at, um, and and taking for granted as places where it would make sense to test something with potentially deleterious effects. Thank you, Riley. I mean, this is a really nice segue. Another audience question. Um, more general, so this certainly invites everyone's perspectives, but more on risk. It's, this is a risk question. So as we think about the, the potential use of these technologies and, and uncertainty around some of their environmental releases, um, some frame it as a risk, right? Or frame these things as risks. So this person asks, might the urgency of climate change- that, from uh, two of our streams are missing. Um, I wonder if our moderator is out um, maybe I can ask the next question to those of you who are still in. Um, so might the urgency of climate change prompt us to engage in um, genetic modification risks that we might otherwise approach more cautiously? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, one, one of the most often uh, risks that are defined with using GM, especially, you know, again, to forest health is that uh, if you make these species more robust or make some changes that those species will then become weedy in the landscape or they'll become invasive themselves and you'll have, you know, them, they will then take over. Um, you know, other uh, critical, other criticisms that have been um, le leveraged against this technology in terms of, you know, forest tree species um, is that, uh, well, you don't know what, you don't know what will happen. Well, if we don't know what happened, we, we don't know what will happen. So I, I you know, I kind of throw that, that, that risk because it's, it's just, you know, you can't, you can't fight against what, um, what you don't know. But if, if you go to the sort of an, an invasive or weedy idea, um, uh, in, in the case of chestnut and other species that have been evaluated for this question, um, it's just so unlikely that that, that, that would happen um, in the case of the species. And so I think when you talk about the technology and you talk about risks, I think it does have to be weighed on a case by case basis. You know, if we talk about something like cold tolerant eucalyptus, that's a very different, you know, uh, uh, topic than, um, cause that, that doesn't have forest health implications for where it's going to be restored. That is solely a commercial aspect. It's not um, cold tolerance um, installation and in a species like eucalyptus and then being planted in say Pennsylvania, um, that's not a native species to the area. Um, that's not a forest health reason. That's not a climate change reason to move you know, eucalyptus into this, into this landscape. So that's, that's a really different application of the technology than something like, you know, disease resistance into a species that is already native to that location. Um, 
so, you know, I would agree. I, I still think that every case should be evaluated for its own pluses and minuses. I think it's important to do that. I think, you know, from my perspective, you look at or from, you know, the perspective of Forest Health, you say, um, and, and I also want to, before I do that, I want to go back to a, a publication that was put out by the National Academy of Sciences uh, at the, in early 2019. It's, it says applications of biotechnology for forest health. And um, that panel spent the first several meetings and also the first several dozens of pages just defining what is forest health, you know? And so you kind of have to ask yourself, what is the utility and the application of this technology and say, okay. And then you can start to say, okay, is this for the greater good, <laughs> you know, define what that is and then start to look at the risk. Are there risks, not of the technology per se, but of the application of the technology. And, you know, in the case of chestnut or a lot of these native species, the risks are relatively low. I think you still need to look at it because you need to look at how the technology is being used. The technology itself isn't evil. It's just how you implement it and then not only implement it into the species, but then put the species back into the landscape. So I think there's a lot of different ways that you can look at the risk, um, but it should definitely be evaluated on a case by case basis. And thank you, Shanta, for grabbing that question. I don't know when I dropped out. All of a sudden, I heard you saying that your moderator was gone. I'm like, I'm still here and I'm still talking. So whatever happened, it's fine. But thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we were talking about this question about um, are we going to potentially uh, think more about some of these more drastic interventions as the climate threats exacerbate basically and i know the chestnut's a really good example i've heard bill powell talk about the urgency and several other people talk about the urgency of both changing climate but also the sort of you know the, the remnants that are living there are dying out so thinking about where we're getting genetic diversity from so there's a lot of pieces of urgency to it but i do want to know if any of the other panelists had questions of or sorry had responses to this question of urgency around climate um, disruption and what kinds of tools we may use in response. I think that just just a, a comment. So when we are looking at the risks of of these future oriented gene technologies, it's also important to to consider well what are the in risks the of wider of climate not, movement. Not acting? I often get concerned when um, urgency is used as a rationalization for uh, excluding uh, others in decision making processes um, because uh, we have to reduce emissions uh, fast and the speed is the only thing that matters uh, whether or not uh, there are people that are benefiting from the processes we use or not and so. Uh, it's a real tension. Um, I don't have an easy answer, which is why there was a long pause after your question. Um, but I do think that the sooner we have, um, we are thoughtfully building infrastructure for relationships of um, trust, mutuality, dialogue about how to engage these decisions, um, it, it, the sooner we'll be able to make these kinds of um, decisions in a more equitable way. Um, with the, with the urgency that they need. An excellent point about urgency. And I know there's been a little delay. So Elizabeth, I think, got cut off to some of us. Um, That's OK. All right, we got it. We got it. Technology Tra funky. Traveling over the ocean. <laughs> oh, no. Got to space and Yeah, I just, I just a very small comment to make. And, and that is, you know, when we're assessing the potential risks of new technologies, um, it's also important to weigh that against the risks of, of not acting and just continuing with the status quo, just to be, have a bit more of a um, balanced view in our assessment. Dear Elizabeth, I'm glad we got to hear your point. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Uh oh. I have a Shanta. Okay, I have a question, Shanta. If you know and can hear us, we can't see you. Um, from Jennifer Kuzma. So, for those of you who know her, she does a lot of excellent work around the governance of these things, and she's really interested in thinking about. Well, right now, the regulatory system, at least in the U.S., is really funneled through this go or no go. 
Um, and I think, Sarah, the work with TA, the American Chestnut Foundation shows us that there's going to be a lot of other small decisions to be made post go or no go with a chestnut in particular. Um, so her question is really thinking about both including that regulatory question, but also looking beyond, like what other places might we make these important decisions? Um, I only brought up the chestnut because that's a case I know very, very well. So I know that that's one place to think about how we make decisions when the regulatory system is relatively simple and it's what it addresses and how we make complex decisions. So what, from some of your experiences, either through CSIRO, you may have a different set of experiences or through um, Riley, your experiences. Elizabeth, did you want to respond to that? I'm, I'm also having technical difficulties hearing the question, so I think I missed a good piece of that. Question is mentioned. I'll bring it back. Um, thinking about beyond the regulatory framework which is often a go or no go decision, what other places might we think about decision making and how how might our work around stakeholder or community work, what are some other sites of powerful decision making beyond the regulatory system? I'm not quite sure how to address that, address that question. Maybe I'll, I'll answer sort of another question and hopefully that'll, you know, maybe uh, spurn some discussion about th that question. Um, you know, I think the regulatory framework right now is, is really interesting because it is so geared toward commercial crops and, and everything that like trying to get um, the regulators to think out of that framework um, of commercial applications and think again, you know, about a forest health that is so foreign, you know, to the system. Um, and again, that, that proceedings from the NAS really, really dives into that, that it is a system that is not prepared to handle these questions of forest health or of climate change. Like that's not how those regulations were put into place. And so, you know, you start to say, well then um, how can we alter the framework to get them to start thinking about, okay, well, there are applications of these technologies that are really important that don't have commercial application. I think I see a, another question in, in the chat that kind of deals with that. Um, how do you have these conversations when you're dealing with something that isn't generating a profit? And that's exactly what we're dealing with with Chestnut. I mean, we ain't making a profit. And and I also don't know that we will even do that. Um, I know folks who grow chestnuts um, commercially and they say, if you get into the chestnut business to make a profit, you're in the wrong business. And, you know, the nursery trade is, <laughs> is a very different place to be. So, you know, I think that um, that's a really important consideration. Um, you know, we're dealing with the USDA, the EPA, the FDA. Um, these are regulatory frameworks that are prepared and they're starting to ask a lot of questions. And oh, even uh, not just now, but over the past five or six years in anticipation of, you know, dealing with um, deregulation of, of Darling 58, which is going on right now until Monday, um, go to the USDA public comment period and make your voice heard. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so there's a lot of questions that they've had to ask themselves. I mean, that we have in return been like, oh, I don't know about that, but they've asked us, you know, um, or, or Bill Powell and, and the folks at ESF that um, we weren't really prepared for because that regulatory framework is, is so, was and still is somewhat narrowly focused. I can respond to this too. Um, I think this is a really difficult question. I, I hope that the regulatory processes that are developed um, have mechanisms of accountability to community input. I, I mean, I think it's it's great to talk about community engagement and it's so important, but um, you know, how do we ensure that the input gained from a community is actually going to shape decisions that are made? So that's a question I don't have a super solid answer to, but I, I struggle with a lot. Um, I also would highlight that for me, I, I'm thinking of, you know, the risk of not engaging particular communities like indigenous communities that have inherent rights um, articulated by very various international frameworks um, to self-determination and sovereignty. So I, I kind of try 
to frame in my writing and conversation with folks that like not engaging these communities properly, you know, risks a violation of self-determination in a way that we should all be sensitive to. Um, I, I've also heard and will highlight suggestions of like convening, um, creating some kind of, you know, third party conflict, uh, conflict of interest free space for deliberation. Uh, Natalie Kofler has written a bit about this and I think this is a really interesting um, idea and maybe a way to get at, at some of these issues. But the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I think for any of, of, of these approaches, we really need to invest in infrastructure to build these practices into our research, right? Like there, a big complaint is that there isn't much funding to do the engagement work that people are being tasked with doing or there isn't funding to train people to do the engagement work that they don't know how to do, right? So I think I would urge funders, <laughs> uh, anyone out there who holds the capital to consider ways to invest in this type of infrastructure that's more um, you know, grounded in these kinds of participatory spaces for deliberation that we're asking for. This is not the first time this exact point has come up in my meetings today. So yes, like thinking about ways that the funding can support the kind of engagement people say they want or organizations say they want is really challenging to get those matched. Um, and if we could clone or grow Keystone, I think that's a good example of relatively third party um, conveners of conversations. Um, so I think related to these questions around the regulatory system and conversations that sort of supplement uh, supplement the regulatory system, I guess, for lack of a better word, since we can't really replace currently. Um, there is such a complicated history in all the countries where we work. Um, what are some of the ways to get more and to uplift more of the voices of, for those that are not at the table? So there are so many good intentions coming out of a lot of conservation projects. Um, in my experience, I've seen so many people working in ecology and natural resources really wanting to do the right thing, um, but not really being sure where to start and not really being sure about um, how to get greater equity and greater justice into their conversations and into their projects. Um, how do we do that? <laughs> how do we do that? And I think those of us working at the boundary might have some insight, but it's also just incredibly challenging. Elizabeth, I want to put you on the spot. <laughs> I just think it, that's a huge question. It is a big challenge. And I think in all of our separate ways, we're trying to chip away at that. And and maybe together we, we will have a bigger voice. Um, but I think also given given the risks associated with genetic technologies, I think that those who are making the decisions are acutely aware of that and, and a, they, they know that they must engage um, with the public and, and do more social science work to figure out, well, how, how are people going to respond to this? Um, so I think I think slowly, slowly, slowly I'm seeing change happen, but still, so it, it is a technology sort of set resource um, where you know if you can show that the science is working, it's that pretty much way. But I think slowly, you know, that gap of of figuring out, well, hang on, we're doing something really risky here, and it's going to affect people and change systems, ecosystems, change people's livelihoods. We do need to pay attention to that too. So I'm hopeful and optimistic that, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be making more and more gains soon. I, I also think it's a huge question and a very hard one to answer. Um, so I, I would just say, you know, I have been part of a, a coalition of organizations that have been trying and trying for years to make climate change more of a kitchen table conversation, something that people feel that they can participate in and talk about um, if they're not scientists, right, which was the perception, um, widespread perception uh, when I got started in this work. And um, I would just say that the 
um, persistence of community organizations and bringing home the conversation in a way that makes sense in your local context and community. You know, these are the impacts, this is what's at stake. Um, that has been what has really helped um, the climate conversation break through um, in a different way. And so uh, I don't have the answers, but um, I do know that that um, I would like Thank you. And I think a lot of the comments in the last few moments in particular highlight how this is a, these are both really big systemic questions and issues. Like these are big systems we're talking about uh, that generated problems that are just rooted in such wicked complexity of history um, so that they need a systemic response. But then we also need this very local community-based, community knowledge-based, like there's such an interesting scale conversation happening about big global systemic change happening one conversation at a time. Um, so I'm really interested in where this goes in the next, well, for us, three or four weeks and whatever happens after that. But in general, like thinking about these these scales and how we can both, we can move mountains like one conversation at a time is really interesting to me. Um, yeah. Can I comment on that, Katie? Please. Yeah, so yeah, I think this issue of scales is something I've been thinking about a lot, um, particularly, like I talked about a bit earlier, this sort of impulse to develop the technology in one place and then trial or implement it in a different place that's very far away. Like I think that's one um, sort of flow of technology and power that we can look at critically as well. Um, I'm a fan of developing things sort of grassroots in partnership with communities, building those relationships early on. And I think that's actually one tension of trying to adapt to these participatory approaches to this context, right? Is because we're talking about community-based participatory research wherein typically you have a relationship with the community and then you say, well, what's the issue? Then you say over a lot of iterative, you know, stages of, of collaborative research, how might we address it? And now we're kind of already you know um, zooming in on a particular issue and a particular solution at that so i think that's one point of tension um, that also relates to these scales too because it can be hard to you know be doing your research in uc san diego and then be wanting to uh, implement a gene drive for an issue that's you know somewhere in oceania oceania where maybe that um, those that team of people leading the technology development like might not have relationships already established. So that's something I draw our attention to to kind of think through together and think about critically. And um, yeah, also just point out that a good place for folks who are on the in the in the boat of being the technology developers and the scientists working on this stuff, like a good place to start is with yourself and locally and asking these ethical questions, right? Um, what is the history of your discipline and, and your institution uh, in relation to some of these communities that you hope your work impacts, right? So, um, so yeah, I, I wanted to respond to the point about scale because I think it brings a lot of these important issues to light. I think um, this might be a good segue to thinking about the idea of there's this, there's this technology already developed and ready, bringing it to the community community for consent, for lack of a better word, versus this co-production of problem identification and thinking about what, on what scale do you gather groups of people to identify problems? Um, and thinking like, well, certainly global climate change is a global problem, but practically at what scale do we think about grouping people to consider solution sets or even not necessarily geographic scale, but across different types of human networks. Um, that's just a really incredible challenge to the kind of work I think a lot of us try to do is figuring out where the right space for intervention is. And even in the context of deep listening, how are you drawing the boundary around who you're listening to? <laughs> or how are you finding the people that you're listening to? Um, because we all bring some degree of blind spots and bias. Um, and I think one of the solutions starts with building out networks like we've started to build out through this panel is, you know, I'm meeting people that I don't necessarily meet normally in 
fields or spheres that I don't necessarily um, work in normally. And I think that's an incredibly powerful way to to build out this conversation and daylight some of my own blind spots around some of the work that I do and try to do. Um, and so I think we are heading towards the final stretch. And for one last question to the group, everyone in particular, no one in particular, but everyone. Um, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, these as tools, these as problem sets, um, but specifically to these genetic technology tools or gene editing tools or genetic engineering. Um, for a problem that you work with on a regular basis is, and I know Sarah's is an easy yes, but is there a way that, that any particular genetic technology could really solve a problem that you can imagine? Or the flip side of that, exacerbate a problem that already exists? It's kind of a tricky question. I, if I can use this opportunity, I saw another question in there about the application of these technologies, not just on the species, on the host of interests who, who are under a threat from these diseases, but using it to attack the attackers. And I think that that's a really compelling way to utilize these technologies and something that, that in, in my experience, hasn't been done a lot. I think it, it might be a little bit more difficult to do that to, I think, you know, it's been investigated for things like Lyme disease. Um, you know, making the hosts not as um, uh, uh, prone to infection or, um, or or the intermediate hosts or trying to attack, you know, the ticks or trying to attack the spirochete itself. There has been experimentation in that direction. Um, and, and I think that those are, real. Um, so someone asked about doing that with chestnut blight, for example, like trying to engineer the fungus. And, and, and I think that uh, so yes, overwhelmingly, there's absolutely a place for these technologies to investigate. I think there's still a lot of these questions that need to be asked, you know, when you start to implement them, you know, maybe it's not, you know, using it in the lab or, but once you try to, you know, apply it into the field and, and where these things go and how they're implemented, you know, that that's where a lot of these questions um, end up being asked. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. And I just want to reiterate for those that got cut out, we're just talking about the ways that these technologies are used potentially in your work or if they could exacerbate a problem that you see. Or both. Yeah, I don't have a clear answer to this, however. So in the case of um, managing those pests, um, with, through gene drives and biasing the, the sex of the litters. Um, so that could definitely, you know, lead to extinction of the species, but obviously it can have unintended consequences where those cats mate with domestic cats. Um, and also, you know, these feral cats live in an ecosystem where there are other predators around. So, so you need to think of the whole ecology and also how cats actually bear their litters and how many over time. So there, there needs to be a lot more assessment of the problem within a broader system. And I think that the general public are, are, some of them are aware of the fact that if you're just introducing these technologies, you're in a way you're not, um, well, what else is being done in addressing the actual cause of the problem? So in our survey, we did find that many, many people actually wrote that out. Well, you know, what about fixing climate change rather than just, you know, putting all these Band-Aid solutions on? Um, so I think there needs to be more sort of holistic view rather than just a narrow, let's just put in place the technology and that'll be the solution to all our problems. Mm. Easy to say, but hard to do. <laughs> That's a nice, nice way to put the moral hazard idea that these are great, um, these are great tools, but we also want to think about their larger context. Um, just want to make sure that Riley and uh, Shanta get final comments if they want to wrap up or share a parting shot. Sure. Um, I'll probably just be reiterating things I, I kind of said, but I, I'm thinking about this really in terms of power and the distribution of risks um, in my work. So 
uh, the question was like, what's an issue this this technology might exacerbate? Um, so I, I think, yeah, while there's many like great potential applications in particular for islands in Oceania, you know, intervention into neglected tropical disease or invasive species management, these things, I'm, I'm looking at the ways that, um, you know, if we don't adopt good participatory equitable approaches to the decision making, we might exacerbate inequality. Um, we might, you know, continue to treat some geographies as more disposable uh, than others. And I think these are the types of things I hope we can mitigate through good deliberative uh, processes and, and, like I said, respect of um, indigenous self-determination. And I'll just highlight that during this our time in our conversation, I've been high, uh, talking about what Creation Justice Ministries does, which is um, education and equipping uh, faith communities for advocacy on uh, various concerns of justice for creation and um, among people. But churches have a huge stake in a lot of issues that um, I think are going to be touched by uh, gene modification. Um, over the years, we, you know, churches have uh, massive hunger relief ministries and uh, healthcare systems and disaster relief operations and uh, refugee resettlement programs and um, are stewards of a lot of land through camps, conferences, and retreats and grounds. And so, um, if um, I think every single one of those areas of um, core church ministry um, that are pretty large scale are going to be touched one way or another. Uh, by this technology. Uh, mindful of the time, thanks to all of our panelists for your time and expertise. This was a lovely conversation. Um, and now I'm gonna pass the mic to Julie to let us know what we do next. And thank you to all of you.